topic of today is in large part about metta or loving kindness meditation. And loving kindness meditation is something that doesn't come easy to me, never came easy to me because I'm rather grumpy and I'm English and <laughs> and you know we don't like bombastic things, we like humble self-depreciating things and so I could never do it and the teachers would say okay just sit and shine this loving kindness over the whole world think of every being as your mother oh, that ruined it right there <laughs> <laughs> and so I would sit and I'm like oh, I don't want to do it when I do meditation, you know, I spend enough time thinking about stuff. I spend all day thinking about stuff. When I sit and do my meditation, I want to stop all that. I don't want to be doing things anymore. So the loving kindness meditation, it made sense to me. It's a sensible practice, but I just I guess I was very reluctant and if you do a meditation or anything I guess half-hearted or a little bit reluctantly you know it's never really going to work did you catch that one? <laughs> and so I was doing this for years and years at the end of the meditation you'd sit and uh, after doing meditation you would do the metta or some kind of sharing of merits it's very important that we don't just do meditation for ourselves, we do meditation for the sake of all well beings. According to the Buddhist schema, there are three levels of merit, what they call merit in Thailand. And often we don't like this word merit too much because it sounds a bit like when you're at school when you're at kindergarten and if you do something good you get like a gold star stuck on your report sheet did you ever get this? and then you go home and you get a gold star for art or a gold star for writing or something and these were merits and if you do something good somebody gives you a merit so Thais often use this word merit and it doesn't go down too well with Westerners the word merit actually in the Thai is in the Thai is bun, but in the Pali is punya. And the word punya means to brighten. And the opposite of punya is papa, or in Thai is bab. And bab means to darken. So punya is things that you can do or experiences that you can have that brighten that make lighter, brighter, sweeter, purer, more beautiful there are three levels of punya and these three levels, the first level is generosity generosity has two kinds first of all is the giving of material things be it money, be it food be it shelter or be it medicine and the second level is the giving of spiritual qualities so giving someone patience, giving someone time giving someone care, giving someone compliments even then these are a form of spiritual giving the next level of punya is sila or morality and the idea is that if you keep the morality, if you keep yourself as a good person with basic precepts, then this is an even higher offering to the world than giving things. And then the third level of punya, or brightening, is called bhavana. And bhavana is development. So if you develop good qualities, good states of mind, this is the highest offering that you can make to the world according to Buddhism so our practice that we do, our meditation is a form of bhavana, a form of development 
we are developing certain specific states of mind and we are developing certain specific observations then this development, this growth as a human being, this development into brighter uh, punya states, this is our offering to the world that we can make. So at the end of every meditation we always do some kind of sharing of merits. And it doesn't really matter, in my opinion, which you choose, there are various different kinds of these beautiful states. The other word than punya is uh, sobana. And sobana means beautiful. So, so in the Abhidhamma they list all the different possible states of mind according to the Buddhist schema of course. There are certain states of mind that are based on greed, certain states of mind that are based on hatred, but certain states that are based on delusion. There are certain states that have no cause or no root. There are certain states that come from meditation and there are certain states that are called sobana. If there is an absence of greed, hatred or delusion, these are listed as sobana or beautiful mind states. So the topic of today is developing beautiful mind states, of which one is actually a metta, or loving kindness meditation. So if everybody's here and everybody's ready and those of you who can sit on the floor somebody want to go first it's hard too many mixed feelings, too many mixed feelings. okay in amongst that mix can you find this does it exist the well-wishing unconditional for all beings the idea, of it. The idea. okay so if the idea of it is clear, you start with the idea. What about, and I'm interested for my own research, is what about the trigger that you use? Do you use the words? May you be happy, healthy? Do you visualize a person's face? Do you visualize light? Do you visualize, how do you do it? What's your key? So what's the trigger? Um, the only thing that works for me is my dog. Your dog? Okay. And so. I never... Okay. So if a dog is the trigger, that's cool. I know somebody who uh, imagines a foal, a newborn horse. Horses don't do it for me, but um, <laughs> kittens would do it for me. Okay, she said she remembers, she thinks of somebody she knows right now who needs, who is suffering and who might need that. Yeah. Okay, so adding into the perception that there is compassion and I guess beautiful beings in this universe and it's not up to you to save them all. <laughs> so you're tapping into a universal movement in a way. But do you do that by a visual image, by saying a particular word, or how is, how, how is the key? So sometimes just knowing there is light and sometimes by remembering one of the bodhisattvas such as Kuan Yin. Go ahead. She said she uses her children because it's easy to to offer unconditionally to your children, but that she also has a difficulty with her mother. <clears throat> and why is it that we can't just offer this to certain people? Yeah. Anyone else? So it's difficult to trigger that feeling for someone to whom you have a negative perception. But that's partly why we always start with the people that we can trigger it easily with, be it ourself or teacher or something. And then once you get hold of the feeling, then you can offer that feeling. To me the key to that, because I would always like have perfect, beautiful, loving kindness towards all beings in the world, except for him, him, <laughs> him, 
uh, not so much, you know, uh, uh, and, and I would, I would have a list of people in, that I wouldn't articulate it, but it would be in my head that, you know, like, some of you don't deserve to be in my list right now. I really noticed that feeling, that, that holding back. And I, somebody, the thing that got me through that was something somebody said once. It's an obvious thing, but like I said, certain times something clicks into place and someone said, people only do bad things because they're suffering. And then that just clicked at that time. And that, oh, okay, I can do it now for all, even the bad people, they wouldn't be bad if they didn't suffer. And that just clicked at that time for me personally. But for these things to click into place, you have to be kind of working it. So, this is what we're doing with the meditation. It, it may be difficult, it may be tricky, it may be very easy for you too, for some people. I was on a retreat, my first ever retreat, and the teacher was saying, you recite these words, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be free from suffering, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be free from suffering. And this is a very kind of audible, thing. Is that the word? It's a thinking exercise. And there was a person there who was really not enjoying this practice at all. It wasn't me. And I spoke to them afterwards. They said, oh, wasn't it terrible, that meta-meditation that he was doing? It just doesn't work. And all that thinking about stuff. And she says, oh, no, 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 I have a much better teacher. He, he has a different way of doing it. And I said, oh, what's that way of doing it? And he said, well, you imagine the whole world in pink. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if that's your trigger, if that's your way in, then use it. It's not that there's a right method and a wrong method. It's whatever the trigger is to get you into that state, into that feeling, then you can start to develop it. If you find it difficult to um, develop, like I said, just pretend you have it. Pretend that you have loving kindness for the whole world. And if you can't pretend that you have it, then you just invite it into yourself. Really nothing comes into you unless you invite it in. This is why in all the movies, vampires, when they come to your house and they knock on your door and they ask you, they try and trick you to make you invite them into the house. Now vampires represent like the bad and the evil qualities, which is why vampires can't stand light. So, bad qualities and good qualities, they can only come into you if you've invited them in. So, there are times when I've sat there just like praying to be somebody who has loving kindness, because all these other people were doing it. And I tell you the truth, 16 years I tried to do loving-kindness meditation and I got nothing. I just, I just couldn't, just didn't exist there. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, all of you be happy, all of you be peaceful now, leave me alone. <laughs> and let me get on with my breathing meditation, because that I can do. But I was always conscious that I was dismissing the practice. I was always conscious that there was an area that other people were doing that I hadn't done, that I hadn't mastered yet. And so I spent quite a long time kind of just asking the universe to teach me, to bring it into me, to help me to be able to do it. And it was much, much later on that I was able to, to start doing this kind of practice. Sixteen years it took me. <laughs> Slow learner for loving-kindness meditation. One of the triggers, not the triggers, but one of the things that slotted into place, we have this practice of remembering the qualities of the Buddha. The compassion, the wisdom and the enlightenment of the Buddha is three qualities. You can also remember ten qualities of the Buddha. And, I, you know, I, I love the Buddha's teaching, but I never had a personal connection with this figure, like some people do. 
And so I, I was just kind of playing around, trying at one point with this, remembering the qualities of the Buddha. And then suddenly I got this v visualization. Now this was my imagination, it's not a supernatural experience. But this visualization of the Buddha being inside me. And then this Buddha being just perfectly giving. And I coupled this with another teaching which is with a Buddha anything that uh, that you put onto them dies and then what the meaning of this is any karma that you take and you throw onto a Buddha it dies right there somebody else told me it's like a bucket like a refuge bin and any rubbish that you throw into the bin the bin has a big hole at the bottom and the rubbish goes out so these two ideas came together in my mind of this Buddha what would I be like if I was a Buddha was the kind of idea and then this idea that any karma that other people's karma that comes to me is going to die right there no more karma gets bounced back no more unhappy or unnice thoughts gets given back and the reason I found it easier to do this as the Buddha was because I can't do that I can't just give back boundless, openless compassion to people who are driving me to the wrong place <laughs> taxi driver, I swear I said to him Wat Pak Nam Pasijaran and he took me to Wat Pak Nam Samutbragan <laughs> it's my fault, I had my headphones on and I said take me to Wat Pak Nam Pasijaran I put my headphones on and I shut off and an hour later I open my eyes and I'm in Samutbragan which is an hour and nearly two hours away from my temple and it's very difficult to have metta for this person <laughs> right? but if I imagine the Buddha being inside me he can have metta, he can have loving kindness to the person so it's easier for me to offload it onto the Buddha kind of thing I'm letting you into the secret machinations of my mind here the point is that there are, you have to be in it, you have to be working it, you have to be trying to do it and even if the practice is difficult you have to keep it in mind and then at certain times, at certain places something somebody says or something that you remember will click into place and then suddenly you'll be able to do it you may be able to do it for 10 minutes or half an hour you may be able to do it with this person but not with that person whatever it is that is your foundation get started on this practice these are what I call altered states of meditation so these altered states of meditation often people get into meditation because they've heard of or they've experienced altered states of consciousness and usually when we talk about altered states of consciousness we are referring to drugs or in psychology we're referring to states of sleep uh, or sleep deprivation or things like this as altered states of consciousness so I like this term altered states of meditation because in terms of consciousness with drugs and sleep and sleep deprivation and REM sleep and things these are really things that happen to you but with altered states of meditation these are states that you are generating and we want to specifically try to generate these wholesome or punya, these bright states or sobhana, these beautiful states of mind because most of the time that you spend in your life you spend putting your energy and attention into getting the things that you want and getting rid of the things that you don't want if I was to follow you around and take note of what's going through your mind how much time do you spend to increasing your compassion and how much time do you spend increasing your earning capacity your potential for a promotion your potential for love finding love with a person that you want how much time do you spend watching TV? I can spend more time watching Judge Judy than I do loving-kindness meditation I always have this 
idea you in Christianity of course when you die you go to heaven and you meet Saint Peter and Saint Peter rather like Father Christmas he asks you have you been a good boy and he has a book and a ledger and he'll take note of what you've done and in Buddhism we have a similar story his name is King Yama and he's a very fierce and uncompassionate God and after you die King Yama will come and look at the ledger of the things that you've done and he will decide which karma that you've done will propel you into your next life so he's accepting that you've done lots of good things and lots of bad things but which deed is going to cause your rebirth into a happy realm or an unhappy realm according to the mythology the legend so King Yama will be there and part of the background of some of these myths and legends is this is how the artists used to represent them before books and CDs and YouTube and things Buddhism as with you know all great traditions was transmitted through stories and the stories were painted on walls so very often the stories that survive are the ones that made for good pictures that the artists would paint on the walls and you see this in Thai temples too so King Yama with his jaws and the whole world in his jaws and in his hands here is like I've got total control and mastery and he's always a pretty nasty looking figure so I wonder when I get to King Yama or Saint Peter and they're going to say you spent in your lifetime you spent 164,291 hours watching YouTube and you spent 4,000 hours practicing loving kindness <laughs> what do I want to show him when I die so I have this image in my mind that these are most of the time most of your effort goes into just getting what you want and not very much of your time goes into actually practicing these good and beautiful qualities well I have compassion I feed the cat I pay my taxes but what more do you want well you know we want more than that you have to if you want to increase your compassion you have to put in an effort and an energy in finding out how to do that if you want to increase your loving kindness you need to make a practice of it or kindness and generosity I love this Thai tradition of putting food in the arms bowls in the morning it's not because I get the food sometimes it's not very convenient you know in uh, Wat Doi Sutep we the monks aren't supposed to use the lift to go down the hillside so we go down the stairs we go around on the arms round in the local town and one of the ideas in Thai culture is what you give is what you will receive so they give you their favorite foods because they want to get their favorite food in the future and they also give you water because they want in the future to never be short of water but if 10 people give you a little give you a bottle like this this is getting like six seven eight kilos that you're carrying in your bag and you have to walk all the way back up those steps to the temple and that's quite a walk at the best of times you try carrying the water and the food and your arms bowl this is 15 20 kilos that you're hoiking up the steps so it's not that we receive the things that we praise the practice it's a beautiful thing to start the day with an act of giving not only an act of giving but an act of giving to the Sangha which means you're supporting this highest ideal of humankind which is enlightenment I would also do a practice as I walked up the steps a practice of loving kindness and loving kindness for all those poor tourists who are going to be walking up the steps during the day so out of my absolute beautiful kindness of heart I would leave them bottles of water <laughs> <on the step. laughs> as I go up the steps <laughs> my loving kindness practice 
So to improve on it, you have to keep it close. You have to try to find ways to make it real. The statement I've written up here, this is the Buddhist teaching, straight out of the suttas. To what a man thinks and ponders often, there is a leaning in his mind. This word leaning comes from a story of a tree. And if the tree grows up crooked, when a strong wind comes and that tree is knocked down, which way will the tree fall? Of course, it will fall in the way that it's already leaning. The idea is we're all growing up a little bit crooked. But when the day comes, which way are we going to fall? So, when your taxi driver takes you an hour in the wrong direction and you find out, which way does your mind fall? Do you fall easily into anger and frustration and making him feel unhappy that he's taken you the wrong way, which I'm ashamed to say is exactly what I did. <laughs> you may feel the anger and frustration, but you don't need to put that onto him. That's the way I train my mind. My mind falls easily into anger and frustration. My mind doesn't fall so easily into loving kindness unless I practice it. If I practice it and I'm keeping it close, then my mind falls easily into the loving kindness. And as soon as I start to feel hateful, angry uh, at myself or at other people, that loving kindness is right there next to me because I'm keeping it close to me. I think of it like the desktop on the computer. What documents do you have on your desktop? In fact, these days, my main documents I have in Dropbox. So my Dropbox folder, that's what's close to me. Because it's right there, as soon as I turn on the computer, I can come back to that document. Compare this to your photo albums from 1975. Right? Where do you keep your photo albums from 1975? They're in a folder with other folders in a box, in a bigger box in the attic, right? You don't pull them out. You may say, well, I have them, I keep them, they're there. They're not really there unless you keep them close on your desktop. So the loving kindness and other forms of beautiful mind states. We've only did the mind, the metta, loving kindness meditation. But there are many forms of beautiful mind state. You need to keep them close. If they're close to you, there is a leaning in your mind. Your mind will easily lean. Another word for leaning that they translate is a bias. Usually we think of bias as a bad thing, but in this case it's a good thing. If the thing that you think and ponder on often is a good thing. So these practices that we do are to keep the beautiful mind states close to us. That way, then, our mind can fall easily into those states. Does it really work when you're offering loving-kindness out to other people? Well, try it. Offer them loving-kindness, and then when you're finished, call them up and ask them, Did you feel something just then? <laughs> Is it possible? I don't know, I mean, you can't say, but I believe so. There's a story of one Dharma teacher I know who was working in a factory and they'd gotten into a negative mind state about somebody and they thought, I know, I'll do lo metta, loving kindness meditation. Now, there happened to be somebody in that factory who claimed they could see auras and they're always telling you, your aura's this or your aura's that or, you know, you you didn't eat vegetables this morning, you ate something else and it's, it's disrupting this part of your aura and this guy had always thought, yeah, 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 pull the other leg. Anyway, so he'd gotten into this negative mind state with a person and decided to practice loving kindness. So he was there really beaming it out, really starting to enjoy it. And this guy walks past and says, wow, your aura just turned green. So, if you fancy a green aura, loving-kindness, <laughs> is it possible? 
One time I had a friend, uh, we had a van trip and somebody was taking the vans with us. And this person is a very, what's the word? Uppity. <laughs> Uppity, do you know that word? Right? Kind of very particular and precise and will let you know the second there is something that they don't like. And what I'd done was, I think we had 32 people and I thought, well, two people aren't going to show up, so I'll get three vans, that's 30 people. And what happened was 31 people showed up. And so in the vans, everyone got a seat, but he had to sit behind the driver facing the rest of the people in the van, reverse seated. And it's not very comfortable. And I knew that I was going to get both barrels because this is not a person who puts up with things easily. I even said I won't charge you for the van seat, but it's not about the money. Uh, so I made sure that I was in a different van all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> sending him, not loving kindness, I was sending him patience. I guess say beautiful mind states are not only loving kindness, also other states. So I was sending, I was beaming patience at him the whole way down. And we stopped about an hour and a half into the trip and we all got off to go to the bathroom at the uh, station. And I went up to him and I said, you know, if, if you would like to take uh, a seat in my van, I'll organize something. I didn't want to say, but I would take the reverse seat because I actually don't mind. You should see some of the temple vehicles that we have to sit in. And so I found him out and I said, that must have been uncomfortable for you. I'm going to change it around so the rest of the trip. And he's like, oh, no, no, it's all right. No problem at all. So it worked. So it worked. <laughs> My patience that I sent him worked. Now, did it work? I have to, I'll leave that for you to decide. There was a, a real experiment done on this. You may remember with TM and it was in the late 70s, I think it was. And they had all the TM practitioners in Washington. Don't ask me if it's Washington State or Washington DC. And they, all the TM meditators got together and made a coordinated simultaneous meditation for peace. And the crime rate dropped by a huge percentage at that time in Washington. And that was DC. So, uh, you know, I'm not giving you the f clear details, but you can look this up. It's quite a famous experiment, and there are critics of the experiment, and there are proponents of the experiment, but there's plenty of websites that show uh, good research into this. And it seems to be that actually it did make a difference. Again, <clears throat> It's up to the individual to decide for themselves. Even if sending these states out doesn't make a difference to the people around you, it's still going to affect your own behavior and your behavior affects the people around you. So either way, this is an offering that you make to the world. This is a way to remember your practice is not just for yourself, but for all world beings. It's also a way to start to distinguish what are Sobhana mind states? What are beautiful mind states? And traditionally we do metta as loving kindness. We also do karuna, which is compassion. And compassion is feeling for other beings suffering. We also do mudita, which is trickier. It took years for me to get this one too. Mudita is feeling joy for other people's success. When I first started doing this, when I finally figured it out, I really started to enjoy this. Because it's so lovely feeling good for other people. Oh, this person is so beautiful or has such a lovely car or has such a nice life or anything good. It's really worshipping and praising the good things that happens to other people. The loving kindness, the metta, is kind of a, I don't know, you say a mixture, but uh, is unconditional. 
So we're not looking at the bad things, we're not looking at the good things. Karuna and mudita are both have an element of judgment, right? For suffering or bad things or for success and good things. Loving kindness is in between, it has neither. So it's unconditional, whatever the situation is, it has a loving kindness. And the fourth one is uh, upeka or equanimity. And equanimity, there is the dull kind and there is the fierce kind. So the dull kind is stuff it. It's a bit of an English phrase. In Thai, is Changman. Any ties here? Changman. It's like stuff it, forget it, don't care. So that's the like the fake equanimity. The positive equanimity is an equipoise, I like that word, because it's a very vibrant, clear, total balance. Again, I like this image of the um, karma dying. Any karma that gets put on you dies right there because you're completely equanimous. And this practice also is quite tricky because there are things that you don't like. You don't like to fall sick. You don't like certain people or certain governments or certain newspapers or certain situations. You do love other things. So to have real equanimity is quite tricky. With the altered states of meditation then, there are two main categories that are useful altered states of meditation. First category is what I would call disenchantment states and feelings. And these are insights that come from meditation. And so certain times you look at something and you just have this overwhelming feeling that's not real. A person or a place or a situation, suddenly you snap out of it and it's not real or it's not worthwhile. Or sometimes you have a state of mind that's there and then suddenly it vanishes and you notice it vanish. You're like, that wasn't real. Disenchantment, I love this word, it's called nipita in the Pali. Nipita, in Thai they translate as burnai, which is to get fed up. And there are the various experiences that lead you towards the dis engagement or the disentanglement with the things of the world. And it's the things of the world that attract your attention outwards. Because your attention leaks outwards, you miss the jitta or the heart or the unconditioned. So I was talking about this last week, that enlightenment is unconditioned or unborn, undying, unchanging. It's kind of like the cinema screen, like this screen up here. We can play images on this screen, any image, any story. Wonderful stories, terrible stories. And we see them on the screen, but the screen has never changed. The screen remains completely unchanged by the thing that's shone on it. In the same way, our own real nature, our enlightened nature or unconditioned nature has always remained completely unchanged. It's that real nature that we are trying to get back to in the practice. So why do we not see that real nature? Because our attention is leaking outwards. Things that we can see, things that we can hear, things that we can taste, things that we can touch things that we can feel, things that we can think about, and we like them or we dislike them. We push against them or we try to pull them in. And this is what keeps our attention dancing around in the world. To get back to this real nature, we have to disentangle. <laughs> he has a mindfulness blog coming up called Disentangled. So for this very reason. So, some of these beautiful mind states might not appear as beautiful mind states because their feelings of burnai, of getting fed up, of disenchantment with things. And I, I love this word enchantment specifically because I, I love fairy tales. And in fairy tales, there's always the evil being puts an enchantment on you, makes you fall in love with the wrong person or gives you creaky knees or whatever it is turns into a frog 
And this enchantment is a spell and it's not real. It's, it's hiding you or separating you from your real nature. But that enchantment in every fairy tale, there is always a trick to breaking that enchantment. And then if you just know the trick, if the frog can just get a kiss from a beautiful woman, then the enchantment is broken, right? So this uh, word disenchantment, the, there are different words. They use disillusionment sometimes as well. On the other side to disenchantment experiences, there are illuminatory experiences where you suddenly see brightness or light when the mind suddenly comes together, when everything kind of coalesces and these are enlightenment experiences. And of course most people really want enlightenment experiences. You don't want to sit there suffering. You don't want to see the unpleasant nature of your obsessive mind. But seeing the unpleasant nature of your obsessive mind will disentangle you from it. So ultimately, if you want to develop wisdom, the disenchantment experiences are longer lasting and more powerful. But people dismiss them because they're not so pleasant. Right? The illuminatory experiences, great faith comes from illuminatory experience. So in the long term, you're better off uh, developing the disentanglement experiences. Which way do you use to key into the beautiful mind states? Well, for me personally, I want to finish with my own way into the metta meditation, loving kindness meditation, was every time I would come and meditate, I just didn't want to do stuff. This is why I was never any good at TM meditation, sit and recite a mantra over and over. I'm like, oh, man, I've got enough stuff in my mind. I know it has benefits and if you do it, it's good, you can work it. I just didn't want to do it. I had this teacher who said, you focus on the in-breath, you focus on the out-breath, and on the out-breath, just as it stops, you focus on your buttocks pressing on the seat, and then back to the in-breath and the out-breath and then the buttocks. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do it. But I did it anyway. I was like, okay, in-breath, in-out, buttocks, in-out, buttocks, buttocks, buttocks to this practice. And I went back and I reported, because I wanted to report that I was doing the practice, so I did it. And I went back and I reported that I did it. He said, fine. He said, now I want you to say, in breath, hands, outwards, buttocks. I'm like, no. <laughs> I draw the line. I'm not doing it. He said, like, oh man, this may work for many people. I, absolutely not saying it's a bad practice. It's just not what I wanted to do. This Tibetan teacher gave me a bodhisattva, I think it was Manjushri, with the sword of insight. He said, this is your bodhisattva, you have to memorize it. The color of the fingernails, the jewels, everything. I'm like, oh. <laughs> stop. And so what I would do is I'd just stop. I'm like, I don't want to do anything in my meditation. And what I find is my mind will do stuff anyway, but when I hold my mind back from this leaking out and doing things, every so often the mind comes together, becomes very bright, very mindful and very clear. And it's right there. So this is the kind of meditation that I would do. And I would say it's more towards emptiness than not generating certain beautiful mind states, but just allowing everything to be empty. And when I would get to that, ah, it's just nice, it's just right, my mind is just so present and happy and bright. And then it occurred to me one day, I was sitting there like this, I thought, what if I just called this loving-kindness meditation? And what if I just offered it out and then suddenly, poof, that was when I could do it. I could just shine this clarity of mind out. And that was how I keyed into the metta meditation when it first started to make sense for me. So, out of the different states that are worth developing, there are disenchantment states, and I'm going to talk more about these in 
uh, one of the future weeks. So long-term disenchantment is, are more powerful. They, are, they will generate wisdom, they'll break your attachment to the world, they will really help your meditation. So those are one set of the beautiful mind states. Uh, the other set, as the illuminatory mind states, you have the mundane illuminatory mind states, which means states that you've de developed through intention. Patience practice, or loving-kindness practice, or compassion practice. All the different mind states that you can think of that are beautiful, and the tricks and the techniques that you use to develop them and bring them up, and bring them close to you, so that your mind leans into them. The other set come from the emptiness practices, which is just where everything stops. That kind of illuminatory experience also is a beautiful mind state. According to, I love these, according to science, there are six scientifically proven reasons to practice loving kindness meditation. <laughs> First one, it increases positive emotions. It is a positive emotion. That's like saying having money makes you rich. <laughs> it is a positive emotion. It doesn't increase my positive emotion. Okay, it decreases your inner critic. That's true. I have a strong inner critic and I'd like to decrease him. It increases your empathy. It's the same as the first one. I mean, that loving kindness is empathetic. That it's like if you have empath if you practice empathy, you're empathetic. I mean, yes. Uh, here's a more practical one, in case you're interested. It decreases migraines. Personally, I've never had a migraine, so not so attractive to me that one. Uh, it increases your compassion. And the last one, this is my favourite of all. I have to check how you say it. It lengthens your telomeres. You know telomeres? I might be saying it wrong. Telomeres are the ends of your genes. Genes are the, the, the DNA, right? The, your amino acids, your four amino acids, and they're going to change, and the chains fold up, and that is a gene as an expression of certain batch of genes. And on the end of these is like a cap. And every time the, the cell divides, the cap gets a bit shorter. And this is what increases your aging and why human beings age. It's not as obvious. You think that it's obvious that animals will age, but actually it's not. Trees don't age. They may get more impurities and they may get more and more impure and, you know, and so eventually they will die. But they don't actually have a programmed aging like animals do. So, apparently, if you practice loving-kindness meditation, it lengthens your telomeres. You seem to know more about this than I do. According to my science, it is not possible to lengthen a telomere. Right. So, take that from us. There are 11 reasons, which I'll finish off with, 11 reasons that the Buddha gave for practicing loving-kindness. And this list makes a bit more sense. Uh, first three reasons, you will sleep more easily, you will wake more happily, and you will not have evil dreams. So that's handy. <laughs> it's true, this thing about evil dreams, if you do bad things, it affects your dreams, right? It just does. Um, it will make you dear to human beings. If you fancy being dear to human beings, to me, you know, I'm, I'm not so, you know, I, I don't mind being dear to human beings, but just so long as you don't come and knock on my door too often. <laughs> this one's a bit more worrying. It makes you dear to non-human beings. 
And the first thing that I thought of was ghosts, because they're inhuman, right? I don't want to be dear to ghosts. Unless there's a ghost already here, then I want to be dear to it. But if I'm dear to ghosts, and I'm pulling ghosts in, uh, but then it occurred to me that non-human beings may be animals, and I want to be dear to animals. Yeah. Kittens, I want to be dear to kittens. And even snakes, you know, I would... I would rather, if there's going to be a snake, I would rather be dear to it. <laughs> I'm not bad with snakes. Snakes and me have a working relationship that we're okay. Spiders, not so much. Uh, but snakes. I know this one Thai woman, she was absolutely terrified of snakes. And she was a very high so uh, woman. She used to make, well, I'm not going to tell you that. And when she was young, she, there was a snake in the house and she got her servants to catch it and hold it. And she took a needle and thread and she sewed its mouth shut. So ever after that, she was absolutely terrified of snakes. So, if you practice loving kindness, then you're, this thing about sleeping more easily, yes, you have less fear. If you do bad things, those fears will stick with you. So dear to non-human beings, here's a good one. Devas will protect you. So the good devas will come and they will look after you. I don't know if this is how we get the next three positive qualities, but fire, poison and weapons will not be able to harm you if you do loving-kindness meditation. These days it's easier, you just get an amulet and the amulet will protect you so you don't need to bother with the loving-kindness. Your mind will concentrate quickly and I'll come back to that one, there's a very nice story about that. Your complexion is bright and this is actually true. When people have been meditating and, when, and I know for myself when I've been meditating and hitting the spot my face just kind of shines. You actually get like a kind of grease will come on the skin and people will actually say to you, oh, you look very like nice today. So it actually does, not just loving kindness meditation but like a pure meditation. And when you die, you will die unconfused and you'll go to a heavenly realm. This thing of concentrating quickly, the Buddha had a uh, very quickly had a story about this. He said that a man who concentrates on his meditation but has not practiced loving kindness, it's like a person who is thirsty and in need of water finds a hoof print, is walking somewhere where there is no water, and they find a hoof print that is filled with water. And in order to get the water from that hoof print, they have to find a straw, kneel down and very carefully put the straw into the middle of the water to suck up the water so that it doesn't get mixed with the earth, so it's unmudded. It occurs to me, I'm just hoping that it's water in the hoof print. But... <laughs> he said, that's like a person doing meditation who can concentrate but has not practiced this morality. Compared to a person who is wandering in a desert looking for water and finds an oasis and takes off their clothes and jumps into the pool and splashes around. So that's the meditation of a person who has practiced loving kindness. So the loving kindness in Buddhism will make you happy. Insights meditation makes you wise. Loving kindness makes you happy. But when your mind is happy, it's easier to concentrate. Okay, so that's beautiful mind states. Uh, we've only mentioned some of the beautiful mind states, but... Are there any questions, thoughts or comments?